y'all welcome back to the channel and we have been very busy here at the farm um the boys are busy with different construction projects um they've landed several construction projects so they've been busy coming and going and working at a distance and then you know we had this crazy windstorm and today we just got like 12 very large cedar trees uh, removed from the property and I lost uh, I had some casualties in the uh, food 401k I lost like five trees they got crushed so we were busy doing that moving trees and brush and everything but I did so we've been kind of short on the content and uh, apologize about that we want to get back on it some type of regular schedule uh, between all the extra work and the heat it's been a challenge and with all of the irons we have in the fire um hope y'all are enjoying the podcast and for those of you that aren't aware check the notes below um and you can see we got some new merch we have fearless podcast t-shirts that are available on the website so then we go check that out and hope y'all sub to the podcast and are enjoying it so when we don't have videos we'll at least have hopefully podcast content um streaming for y'all and they're on all the different pod catchers um, but I wanted to review this article with you and I'm going to throw it up here on the screen maybe we can talk about it for a little bit um, oh, I forgot to activate it before I throw it up on the screen all right this comes from uh, a blogger Alan Brown and uh, there's usually a lot of really good stuff on here but it's it's talking about uh, short selling JP Morgan and uh, it, when FDIC put Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank into receivership in March, a study reported on the Social Science Research Network found that nearly 200 mid-sized banks were similarly vulnerable to bank runs. And we, we, did, we hit on that article about that report, um, and that report was from January or February about those 200 banks. And we all know that SVB just previously had passed its stress test before it supposedly collapsed or whatever um first republic bank went into receivership in may but the feared contagion of runs did not otherwise occur why not as was said of lehman brothers 15 years earlier the targeted banks did not fall they were pushed or so it seemed one blogger showed how even jp morgan chase the country's largest bank could be pushed not perhaps by local short sellers but by china 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 and that is another good reason not to provoke the chinese dragon into war by other means now the one thing i do want to point out with this article is anytime we see this type of slant that this could be an act of china you know that could be a preconditioning thing so that when because as we've seen in this new world order and the way that everything's constructed with rings of power and that we see with the world economic forum we see all of these usual suspects are participants together just like that uh international virtual that that uh well we have estonia right so that's that total virtual thing going on there in the balkans and that is uh international and then we have that thing in the united arab emirates i forget what that uh global work is there but it's all those islands and the whole thing's going to be super transnational and China's funded it, Russia's funded it, U.S. funded it, U.N.'s funded it. So we see this, all this transnational overlap. So when you see this thing about, well, China could do this, you know, that could be a uh, telegraph that when this cyber attack comes, it was China or whoever. So I take that part with a grain of salt, but the facts still remain. The targeted crypto banks, SVB, Signature, and First Republic, were not insolvent they had sufficient assets largely long-term treasuries to match their liabilities they were just illiquid they lacked enough readily available funds to meet the unanticipated deluge of deposit withdrawals in march oh did i say balkan i thought i said baltic my bad 
I am American and I'm not real up to speed on all my uh, global vernacular, but uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, they were just illiquid. They lacked enough readily available funds to meet the unanticipated deluge of deposit withdrawals in March. In fact, no bank could withstand a bank run in which 85% of its depositors demanded their money back in the space of three days, as happened to SVB that month, especially since we consider since 2020 and the whole COVID debacle thing, uh, they eliminated fractional reserve banking. So fractional reserve banking is no longer a thing because they lifted the fractional requirement, um, which makes it even more impossible for any bank to be able to withstand any type of run on cash. Um, so it's just, you know, it's setting up the tipping point. As of December 31st, 22, SVB had roughly $211 billion in assets, which were primarily offset by $173 billion in deposit liabilities, but it had only $13.8 billion in actual cash and equivalents, <laughs> liquid money available to meet withdrawals. It had been flooded with deposits from tech startups funded by venture capitalists, and the startups did not need loans. The deposited reserves had therefore been used by treasury securities at the time when the interest rates were so low that only long-term securities provided an adequate return. Some were mar marked hold to maturity, meaning they could not be sold at all, and the rest could be sold only at a major loss since old bonds attracted fewer buyers after interest rates on new bonds shot up in the last year. Yet, many other banks had followed that path, investing in long-term assets that could not be liquidated or could be liquidated only at a substantial loss. So why did only SVB Signature and First Republic wind up in government receivership? As explained in my early article here, um, oh, so let me do this, y'all. I'll post this in the, so you can hit the hyperlinks. I'll post this in the chat. Now, this chat's probably only going to push to the YouTube channel, but we are streaming on YouTube, Rumble, and Twitter. Um, but I'm not sure how to integrate all that stuff yet. I'm still working on my technology, y'all, so... Um, they were considered crypto-friendly banks uh, in a revealing article called Operation Choke Point 2.0. And if you can remember, if you've been following us um, for the last year or so, we covered Operation Choke Point 2.0. Uh, we actually, I think we we actually covered Nick Carter's article here. Um, the coordinated ongoing effort across virtually every U.S. financial regulator to deny crypto firms access to banking services. Whoever investigated the raid on the three targeted banks, their stock was heavily short sold, driving share prices down. This alarmed the venture capitalists who alerted their tech startup clients. Word spread quickly by social media and the bank runs were on now any of y'all that have been kind of in to uh financial stuff and researching it and reading about it uh i think the book was called black tuesday but what it was is it was uh 9 10 2001 and the airlines that were involved in the terrorist attack <laughs> were heavily short sold by unknown entities even though the sec uh has enormous regulation and all these different different things and zarbanes oxley and all this stuff and somehow these people were never um brought to light who short sold the airlines and made billions um the day before 9 11 by short selling and some of those i believe if i remember were naked shorts as well and I mean, basically, a naked short is, unless you're a complete idiot, you absolutely know what's going to happen. Um, the infamous bear raid, and in 2010 article entitled, entitled Wall Street's Naked Swindle, Matt Taibbi showed that the bankruptcies of both Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers 
which triggered the banking crisis of 08 and 09, were a result of targeted short sales. Taibbi wrote, when Bear and Lehman made their final leap off the cliff of history, both undeniably got a push, especially in the form of a flat-out counterfeiting scheme called naked short selling. Wall Street had turned the economy into a giant asset stripping scheme, one of whose purpose is to suck the last bits of meat from the carcass of the middle class. And I will, you know, Wall Street is exclusively a wealth transfer. And if you want to play on that roulette wheel, um, you may benefit from gambling, but you could get very burnt. And the predominance, 98% of all investments fail. And when you go to college, they teach you that in investing and that's investing 101 and 98% of all investments fail. So if that is true and all of these middle class people that want to retire and have pensions and all this, how is that supposed to work? And whatever you're paying your financial advisor, or however he's being paid through um, commissions or what have you, if 98% of all investments fail, do all of his clients succeed or do 2% of his clients succeed? It's an interesting question to consider. And those people that continue to play in the stock market, um, from my conversations with them, um, usually they take a beating in the stock market and they do rather well in real assets like real estate and in other uh, types of investing I divested out of the market in 2008. We have not been back invested in the market since 2008. And um, we just invest in real estate, uh, dirt coin, our food 401k infrastructure, heavy equipment and assets and uh, lead, steel, gold, silver, different things like that. Uh, Real assets that, that actually hold value that tangible assets that can't be manipulated because you're holding them. And as we know, gold and silver are heavily manipulated through derivatives. And uh, if you are looking, there's a, it's a great buy right now on gold and silver. The spread is incredibly low. It's a great buying opportunity. So check the notes below. Uh, give Stacy a call over at the Financial Prepper and uh, she will give you a very competitive quote. Uh, call and get her a quote. Let, let her know that the Texas boys sent you, but if you are looking to diversify your assets, it is a great time to do so, or to at least, um, if you're looking to make another purchase. Even countries have been victims of targeted short selling of their currencies. One infamous case occurred in 92, according to Investopedia. George Soros is said to have broken the Bank of England and precipitated Black Wednesday in the UK in September of 92 as a result of massive bets he made against the British pound. As a consequence, the pound rapidly devalued, leading to an estimated $1 billion profit for Soros and his quantum fund. Uh, Bear raids were also responsible for the Asian crisis in 97 and 98. I'm pretty sure that one in Asia they blamed on the one British trading guy which is so hilarious and they and they actually made a movie about it with Ewan McGregor uh, and they blamed that crash on one guy and they claimed that he could manipulate the whole market and what's really nice is when you have a patsy like that um, it's really cool because everybody can blame everything on him and then the the really nefarious, very ultra mega wealthy people can just stockpile and redistribute your wealth into their pocket. The crisis started in Thailand when the government ended the local currency de facto peg to the U.S. dollar after depleting much of the country's foreign exchange reserves, trying to defend it against months of speculative pressure. Just weeks after Thailand stopped Defending its currency, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Indonesia were also compelled to let their currencies fall as speculative market pressures built. By October, the crisis spread to South Korea, where a bounce of payments crisis brought the government to the brink of default. No bank is safe from a targeted takedown. Now, what they don't talk about about Bears and Stearns 
is basically Bears was let to collapse and implode and uh, Lehman Brothers was bailed out by the government. And for years, I've always wondered, I wonder why Bears got the drop and Lehman was bailed out. And then if you read in um, Whitney Webb's book, uh, The United States of Blackmail, it's a two, two-part series book, what you'll see is that Efri McJepstein was heavily involved in Lehman Brothers. So um, maybe that's why they were bailed out. I don't know. Because Efri McJepstein is, has lots of connections to lots of people and lots of district of criminals and lots of uh, demon crats and republicards and all that stuff. So no bank is safe from a targeted takedown, which brings us to the largest bank, U.S. Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase. First Republic, SVB, and Signature were not small banks. The country's second, third, and fourth largest bank failures. They had assets of $229 billion, $209 billion, and $118 billion, respectively. But unlike JPM, they were not globally, systemically important banks. G-S-I-B. Credit Suisse, however, was, and it too went bankrupt after it was subject to massive short selling and deposit withdrawals in March of 23. Even GSIBs can be vulnerable. JP Morgan, however, is the fifth largest bank in the world with assets of $3.7 trillion. And, you know, we, we've learned a lot recently with J.P. Morgan and Blackstone, BlackRock, and all these different manipulated banks, uh, manipulative banks. I think Jamie Dimon is currently the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, and they talk about how they're going to influence and manipulate people to comply with ESG and DEI. And this is all part of the CBDC nonsense. And this is why I have no fear of China short selling JP Morgan because they're all in on it. Um, I'm not saying that China won't be blamed for it, but uh, who could possibly bring that behemoth down or have the motivation or assets to do it? In March 28, 2023, post titled How to Wreck a Big Old. GSIB Bank, or as they'd say down here in Texas, a big O. They'd call that a big O. An anonymous blogger going by the pen name Deep Throat IPO laid out a plausible scenario. He observed, interestingly enough, JPM has about the same amount of cash on hand available for immediate wire as SVB did when it blew up. Wow, that's light. <laughs> However, he wrote, it has other liquid assets totaling about $884 billion. That sounds like a lot, but JPM has about $2.34 trillion in hair trigger deposits liabilities on the books. 15% of the total $16 trillion in deposits sitting on the books of the 2,135 U.S. banks with assets over 300 million that can move anywhere in the world with a few mouse clicks. That's wild. That's, that's some crazy stuff to think about, y'all. Deep Throat IPO argues that China, 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 China has the U.S. assets sufficient to trigger a bear raid on this gargantuan bank largely because of the unique way it handles its own currency yeah or the way that it doesn't handle its own currency china has been manipulating its currency this is what makes this whole BRICS notion foolish and silly is because you have uh you know russia china brazil and you have this conclave of these uh, communist countries that have been manipulating their own currency and their own people and somehow they're going to become this bastion of truth with a true gold backed whatever it's just it's all it's all new world order talking points 
and it's all the manifestations of new, newer, bigger, and better boogeymen. You know, now that El Cieta and all these other, you know, Islamic and domestic terrorists, you know, you got to keep changing the fear tactics to, uh, it's rather funny to me, I think. Um, in the domestic Chinese economy, yuan are used, and the PBOC can print them at will. Huh. Merchants exporting to the U.S. take their dollars to the bank, trade them for yuan, and pay their workers and suppliers in yuan, leaving the POBC with free U.S. dollars. This maneuver is confirmed in Investopedia. One major task of the Chinese central bank, the PBOC, is to absorb the large inflows of foreign capital from China's trade surplus. The PBOC purchases foreign currency from exporters and issues the currency in local yuan currency. Uh, the PBOC is free to publish any amount of local currency and have it exchanged for Forex foreign exchange. This publishing of local currency notes ensures that Forex rates remain fixed or in a tight range. It ensures that Chinese exports remain cheaper and China maintains its edge as a manufacturing export oriented uh, economy. Above all, China tightly controls the foreign money coming into the country, which impacts its money supply. Printing domestic currency is another measure applied by China, the POBC, can print yuan as needed, although this can lead to high inflation. However, China has a tight state-dominated controls on its economy. Communism works so well, it's so efficient, which enables it to control inflation differently compared to other countries. Uh, that is baloney. That's an absolute total lie. It just gives it a bigger, deeper, thicker, or different colored carpet to sweep it under. But it cannot control inflation using other means. If that just means, you know, you steal other people's stuff and redistribute their money, uh, maybe that's the case. But all of this China nonsense and, uh, you know, all you have to do is read the Anglo-American establishment or tragedy and hope, and you'll learn how Heinz Kissinger and Bazinia Brzezinski came up with the Chinese scam for the uh, banking cartel, and then they started this whole Chinese thing in the 70s. The same time, the Club of Rome wrote about the, the existential threat we want to choose is climate change so that we can control everybody and it's right in the 1970 club of rome document and we're now watching that manifest uh in real time simultaneously why why uh china 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 while china and russia and all of the old world order boogeymen are repackaged into the new the new boss is same as the old boss. <laughs> Deep throat IPO comments, the key for Russia, China, Middle East regimes, etc., is to set up these export relationships with legitimate Western businesses, continually collect Western currency, maintain a significant trade surplus, and reinvest the currency in Western assets while keeping them while keeping the RMB Yuan walled off. The goal is not free trade. The goal from the Chinese access perspective is the accumulation of Western currency and financial assets. And it's been working beautifully for more than 25 years. And it will continue to work as long as the Chinese access trade surplus with the rest of the world continues to remain substantially positive. We know that the party has been successfully walling off the currency since there are no meaningful yuan balances anywhere on the planet other than the mainland. There's no need because nobody uses Chinese currency for commercial investing other than on mainland China. Today, the world's second largest economy only lets about 2% of the global sediments occur in yuan. Yet, the only thing that they're not considering is the same type of Western debt-based uh, development China has done with all these ghost cities and with all these empty high-rises and all of these half-completed cities, just like we saw during the uh, 
sports balls of Olympics when, uh, you know, China had to show us how um, industrialized they were and everything. And what about all of that? And where did all of that funding come from for all of these government cities and all this stuff? And they can control their inflation and all this stupid. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of good stuff in this article, but when you make some kind of dumb statement that they can control their inflation, they cannot. Okay. You know, I know, I knew, I know George W. Bush said we had to abandon free market principles to save the free market uh, with no one realizing the fact that as soon as you abandon free market principles, it ceases to be a free market. Not that it hasn't been a free market for a very long time. And we have been a debt based economy for since the civil war, basically. So, you know, um, so we're definitely not capitalistic in any way because nobody even knows what capitalism is. And the savings rate in America, I think, right now is negative 2%. So that is a direct indication that capitalism in the broader sense is completely dead and gone. Um, and that's a tip. You know, observe the masses and do the opposite. So you should be capitalizing uh, your future. You should be saving as difficult as it is. Uh, it, and it is a discipline and it does require... Uh, you know, sacrifice, and uh, and it will set you apart from the masses. Uh, the Chinese government and affiliated Chinese entities have purchased not just U.S. treasuries with their dollars, but U.S. stocks, real estate, farmland, and other asset, assets. Deep Throat IPO calculates that the Chinese have a, accomplished destructive control of approximately $58 trillion of Western financial assets stealthily hiding in Western financial markets, like in plain sight. That's $58 trillion focused directly on select targets is more than enough to sink our previously thought unsinkable fleet of battleship banks. Not that China would, but it could. In peaceful time, it profits from the trade with the U.S. just as we need Chinese goods. But all is fair in war, and it is prudent to be aware that these covert potential weapons before fanning the flames of aggression. Cooperation serves the people on both sides of the conflict better than war. Other defenses, Deep Throat IPO admonishes that when a financial institution perceives that it is under attack, there needs to be a circuit breaker. Our banks should not blindly wire out all of the current withdrawal requests or accept the incoming wires. Whenever withdrawals or deposits breach normally daily volume by a significant amount at any particular institution, we need to stop. We cannot continue to come to the nebulous conclusion that, oh boy, it looks like we need another systemic liquidity boost and blind, blindly provide it. We need to slow the entire process down. Now, one other way to do it is instead of liquidating the bank into receivership and providing the funds to slurp up the assets by one of the big five or six is why not just cover <laughs> that bank short <laughs> and let the bank continue to function since it's not insolvent. That's just an idea. And, and I realize it's, it's, it's definitely a communist social idea, you know, but it's kind of interesting the way that they do it so that they do it in such a way that the too big to fail get too bigger to failer. You know what I mean? And it's just like you're making the problem worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're and and just it just so happens that the big six continue to buy to get billion hundreds of billions of dollars worth of assets for pennies on the dollar. So that's kinda that's kinda neat for them. <laughs> Jamie Dimon. CEO of JP Morgan argues that short selling bank stock should be banned. Better yet, as argued in my earlier article here, would be to make all short selling illegal. Well, that'll never happen because everything that the district of criminals does and everything that bankers do, relatively speaking, is illegal, but they get to do whatever they want. So. <laughs> Another possibility comes to mind. Banks are vulnerable to short selling only if they are publicly traded. Check this out. State-owned or city-owned banks are impervious to that sort of attack. Oh, so if it's 
if it's a state-owned bank like Bank of China and it's backed by the Gubermat, it's impervious to that sort of attack. The Bank of North Dakota, our one and only state-owned bank, is a stellar example. Now, now the Bank of North Dakota is a stellar example, and there are these different bullion banks and these different states that are uh, putting in fiscally responsible mechanisms. Um, Texas now has a bullion bank. Oklahoma is considering um, a banking law with some type of gold and silver cash reserve. So that's pretty cool. Um, I just kind of get super geeked out when people say state owned or city owned stuff, you know, because how does how does state own things and how do cities own things? Because states are people and cities are people. You know what I mean? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, you know, and it's the consent of the governed. So the government doesn't have any power in and of itself, but those powers are derived by the, uh, by the consent of the governed. So what, what we have unalienable rights, right? And then we bequeath really a part of those rights to our government to do good. And it's like the same thing when you start talking about state owned or city owned, you know, and now if you have somebody that's fiscally responsible, like North Dakota, it's a good thing. But what happened when that state shifts to like super commie and then a state owned bank wouldn't be that cool. Okay. So, you know, it's always, it's always kind of like, it geeks me out a little bit when, uh, it cannot be short sold and it is not vulnerable to bank runs. How about just backing your deposits with a real asset? You know, <laughs> uh, the bank of North Dakota also acts as a mini fed for local North Dakota banks, extending a lifeline in the event of capital or liquidity shortages shortages. Like the U.S., China has a vast network of local banks, but most of its banks are government-owned. We may need to follow suit as a matter of defense. We may, we may, need, we may need to federalize our banks. Just like Alexander Hamilton, <laughs> like the Federal Reserve isn't enough. We might need... Like the U.S., China has a vast network of local banks, but most of its banks are government-owned. We may need to follow suit as a matter of defense. We need to ensure, however, that the government-owning our local banks actually represent the people. Banks should be public utilities serving the public interest. Now, anybody that's that dumb and foolish, no, what the government does, the government ruins and destroys and trashes everything it touches. So what you can expect the government to do if they federalized all the banks is they would fleece, they would put an IOU in the bank, they would steal any deposits, and they would leave every one of us holding the bag, and it would be a taxpayer bailout. And that's what the government would do, and that's what the government has done. The only governmental solution in America and, and anywhere is to shrink the size of government 98%. And as soon as somebody wants to offer that as a solution, um, that is a worthy solution that I can stand behind. That's somebody that I can vote for, and that's actually going to make a difference. But until someone is willing to drastically, I mean, I would even, I would even consider somebody reasonable if they wanted to shrink the government 10%. And that's certainly none of these are conservatives that we currently have running. That's not, you know, that's not Trump or DeSantis or Vivek or any of these guys. As soon as they start talking about shrinking the Fed, you know, all they want to talk about, they want to talk about, let's take these 87,000 new IRS agents and put them on the border. So they want to, they want to maintain the size of the ultra mega overbloated B system, but they just want to use their, that satanic force for good. You know I mean? It doesn't work like that. That's not a solution. That's not going to work. But so just wanted to share that with you all. Thought it was very interesting. And, 
And the other thing that I wanted to share and illustrate is this is how we always have to consume and absorb information with um, with an open mind to consider it, but then also use logic, ration, and reason to it, interpret it and imply it. Because most of that article is very good and I really agree with it, but then the end synopsis is stupid and foolish and naive at best. And, uh, but you know, and I know, I know the real solutions are incredibly difficult, probably impossible. And that's why we have a, uh, you know, that's why we have a farm. That's why we practice permaculture. That's why we've moved out to the country. That's why we get out of the flashpoints because there's no, there's no way to, to vote our way out of any of this stuff. So it's, it's better and easier and it's more fulfilling to, Take control of your life and control the things in your life that you actually can control on a daily basis, you know, and work to being more self-sufficient, develop community, develop parallel community, parallel society, parallel economy, right? Barter, develop networks, love your neighbor, right? Grow your own food. That th- These are real solutions that people can do and you can start today and you can network But just like listening to political talking heads and going to rallies and rah, 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 and we want to pass this legislation and that legislation, and uh, it's it's just kind of a a super joke. And, I mean, it's a uniparty anymore. And they're both, you know, it's just a different flavor. And one, one train's a little bit faster, you know, flying off the edge of the cliff. But it's the same thing. It's very similar to that article. You know, the article flip flops back and forth and then says, you know, China could take us all down. But really what we need to do is do just like China did. I mean, come come on. Hello. Duh. What did you just type that? Like you when you type that, like you had to read it and proofread it. And when you reread that, that made sense, you know, but she probably went to a government propaganda camp and then went to a higher scholastic ivory tower. And that's where you get postmodern communistic thought you know that's where postmodernism comes from so he's a postmodernist you know there you go the commies were right well i hope you all have an awesome day please sub to the fearless podcast and this is a value for value proposition if you do enjoy our content uh please check out the texasboys.com uh everything should be stocked right now i think there's still maybe a beef and a pork left um, if you are looking, if you're local and looking for beef or pork, there might be one more cow. We want to thank all of our customers, and uh, we just we just love y'all. We appreciate y'all, and we'll see y'all in the next video.